Well, today we are going to begin a, a walk through the book of Mark. And so if you'll go ahead and open your copy of the scripture to Mark chapter 1, verse 1, uh, we're, we're going to begin that here in a little bit. Um, Sam Tolson tells the story of um, Ann Kimball and the wonderful way that she has or had of sharing with people about Jesus Christ. Anne was the dean of women at um, Eastern Nazarene College in Boston, Massachusetts. And she would, uh, she would speak all over the country, given her position. And, and, uh, and one day she was flying from Boston to San Francisco. And it had been an excruciating week. I mean, she was just wrung out. And she got on the plane and she sat down and she, she breathed a little prayer. And she said, Lord, please don't make me talk to anybody today. I'm so tired. No sooner had she finished that than this businessman sat down right next to her. And she felt the Lord say, you need to talk to him. <laughs> Come on, Lord, I'm so tired. No, you need to talk to him. So she leaned over. She introduced herself. She said, hi, my name's Ann. And um, uh, um, I would like to sing you a song, if that's okay. <laughs> Awkward. She said, it'll be quiet, and I, and I won't embarrass you. It'll be short. He said, well, okay, but hurry it up. And so she sang. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. Hap, do you know what confusion is? I do. All I have to offer him is brokenness and strife. Hap, do you, do you know what brokenness and strife is? And I do. He made something beautiful of my life. Hap looked at her and said, thank you. That's a great song. I like that song. My wife would really like that song. You see, she's a good Catholic. And she's a very religious woman. And she goes to Mass five times a week. She would love that song. Now, as for me, I'm an atheist. And Anne's eyes lit up. And she said, oh, really? That's great. He said, really? She said, yes. I've never spoken to a real live atheist before. You see, I've never met one in person. And, and listen, just because you don't believe in God, Hap, his name was Hap, by the way, doesn't mean he's not real. He doesn't mean he's not there. He said, really? She said, yeah. I have a giant of a God living inside of me. We're out to change the world by God and I. And we have great dreams for guys like you. Hap said, you do? And they had this conversation back and forth for several minutes. And, and she noticed him turn his head to where she could not see. And, and she noticed out of the corner of his eye came a tear rolling down. through. For the next five and a half hours at 35,000 feet, they had this wonderful conversation about the God who is. You see, God was active in Anne's life. He wasn't just sitting around watching what would happen. And when they landed, Hap asked if he might have her address because he would like to write her. And she gave it to him and said, Remember, Hap, I have a giant of a God in me. My God in me, we dream big dreams for guys like you. And someday, when you least expect it, he may just invade your life. And with that, they parted. Two weeks later, she received a letter 
from Hap. And it said, Dear Ann, I've not asked this Jesus that you talked about into my heart yet. But I want you to know that somewhere at 35,000 feet between Boston and San Francisco, for the first time in my life, I believed that God is. You see, God worked in and through Anne. To reach Hap. And helped him move, at least all we know of, from being a person who just was completely, utterly against believing that God even existed. To someone who discovered that God does exist. He is here. Today we're going to begin walking through the book of Mark. Have you ever wondered why we have four different accounts of the same story? All of them have variations and and they have uh, details. Some have details that others may or may not have. Uh, Some some of them, the order is a little bit different. But they all really tell the same story of Jesus Christ, who he was, and why he came. I ran across this quote by the Bible scholar J. Vernon McGee. Some of you know who that is. Uh, it speaks to why we have four different Gospels. He, uh, J. Vernon McGee says, and I quote, Matthew is directed to the religious man. Mark was written to the strong man. Luke is addressed to the thinking man. The Gospel of John is directed to the wretched man, the man who needs salvation, end quote. Each book has a different audience. It's written from a different perspective, yet all Together, they tell a complete story of who Jesus is and why he came to earth. I think of Mark. I was uh, sharing with Chad the other day. Uh, at, uh, um, I'm going to be going through the book of Mark. And, and that you know Mark is kind of straight to the point. He doesn't have a lot of the details that Mark or Matthew and Luke especially have. So I kind of think of Mark as a man's book. Doesn't bog you down with all the details. Get straight to the point. You know. And so, uh, also, another reason that I think of it as a man's book is it's full of action. Mark just kind of moves right along. He doesn't, doesn't hang out too long in one place. He, he just gets, gets going and shows Jesus at work in people's lives. And, and uh, Jesus meeting needs and, and sharing about them. And it, Mark is very active. One other thing you'll want to know about the Gospel of Mark, um, which I I also think could be a third reason that I I believe that it's a man's book, is that Mark is writing from Peter's recollection of his time with Jesus. Mark is credited with the authorship of, of the book, but really this Mark that we see is John Mark, who is the young man who was we see traveling with Paul and Barnabas through the book of Acts. Mark, John Mark, probably, possibly, wasn't even born when Jesus was ministering on the earth. But he did get to meet Peter. And he got to listen to the stories that Peter told about this God-man, Jesus Christ, who is active in and for and through our lives. So today, I'm going to use the word active as an acrostic for our outline. If you'll stand with me, please. Um, I'll read aloud from Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, the first 13 verses. And and, um, I'm going to share with you six things that I found in this text that that spoke to me. Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair. And with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. 
And he preached, saying, Here comes, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water. But he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here today. Lord, for the freedom that we have here to worship your name in song, to study your word together, Father, to meet corporately, Lord, may we not take that for granted. May we use it for your kingdom and your glory and your honor. Be with us today as we look at this text. I pray, Lord, that you would open our spiritual eyes and ears and you would uh, soften our spiritual heart, Father, that we may see and hear and know your word, your message for us today, that we may use it for your glory and your honor. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. The first thing I see in verse 1 is that God actively authors. God actively authors. It says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Way back in the Garden of Eden, at the beginning of what we know as time, God created this beautiful place for Adam and Eve. It was humanity's own paradise. It was perfect. Had everything they would ever need all the food they would ever need, all the activity they would ever need, because God, it says that God gave Adam a job. His job was tending the garden. We, we as human beings were created to work. We've made it a four-letter word. Okay, you'll get that about 3 o'clock in the morning, all right? But work is good. And we were created to do it. And God gave Adam and Eve one little rule. He said, man, I, I've created all of this for you, for you. Just, you see that tree over there? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Leave that tree alone, okay? Everything else is all yours. Have free reign over the whole garden. Just don't touch that tree. And so what happened? Humanity, like human beings are, saw an opportunity. Satan came in, and he twisted the words of God. Did, did God really say this? And humanity sinned and ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, there is a belief called deism that says, yes, God exists, and yes, God created everything, but once he created it, he stepped back, and he's passive. He just sits there and he watches to see what's going to happen. That is not God. That is a false idea and a lie about who God is. Our God is not passive. He does not sit idly by, nor did he sit idly by when humanity sinned. He had a plan. And he actively began working that plan. And all through the Old Testament, you read, I'm reading through the Old Testament chronologically, and I'm, I'm at uh, uh, David now, past David and Goliath, and David and Jonathan, and, and, uh, and it's interesting to be able to see from the beginning all the way up so far, and, and I've read through this before, and all the way up to the end of the Old Testament, we see God working a plan, preparing everything for what Galatians 4.4 4 says, as Paul wrote, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a virgin. 
God didn't sit idly by. He actively worked out his plan of the gospel. And in verse 1 of Mark, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see this, this gospel, this plan that God is act, actively worked out is, is his plan of the gospel. God is the author of the gospel. It is, was his idea, his plan, his son, his sacrifice, all to his glory. The gospel belongs to God. He is the author of, gospel, of the gospel. God also has a plan, not only for mankind through the gospel of Jesus Christ, but God has a plan for you and I, for each one of us. And it is a good plan. In Ephesians 2, uh, 8 and 9, it is my favorite scripture, which speaks to salvation, for by grace you are saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But then verse 10 speaks about that plan. It says, for you are Christ's workmanship. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works that he planned in advance for you to do. God has a plan for your life. And he wants to work it. You have to come, though, to the beginning of of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Because God is the author not only of the gospel, but of your life. He is the author of the plan for your life. God actively authors. But also, the second thing, God actively calls. In verses 2 and 3, is written by the prophets, In the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. This messenger that was sent before Jesus Christ was John the Baptist. Actually, he was Jesus' cousin. Born six months before Jesus was, John came and he began preaching in the wilderness. And announcing, there's someone coming after me. I am not worthy to untie his sandals. We're going to see a little bit more of that in the next section. But but God called John the Baptist, who gave, and John the Baptist gave all of his life to the call of God upon his life. He was what we might term today a hermit. He lived in the wilderness, out in the desert. He wore camel hair and a leather belt. That's another reason Mark's a man's book. He provides those details, which are important to men. Lots of leather and lots of fur. Okay. But we can, yeah. Somebody watches too much tool time. He had, but because John gave his life over fully to God's plan and his call upon his life, he made a great impact on the world for the kingdom of God. Jesus said about John the Baptist, said there is no man who has ever lived who has ever been greater than John the Baptist. How would you like to have Jesus say that about you? Wow. And just like John the Baptist, if we will give our lives completely and fully to God's call upon our lives, we can make an impact on the world for the glory of God as well. If you can remember three things. First of all, live out your calling. God has called you for something. Discover what it is and live it out. The second is live your life to honor God. Don't worry about what your friends are going to think. Don't worry about what your family's going to think. Don't worry about what your coworkers are going to think. You seek out your calling in your life, and you worry about what God is going to think, and you live your life to honor God. And the third thing that we need to remember is that wherever you are, preach the gospel. That word preach simply means proclaim. And in Romans chapter 10, it says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How will they hear unless there is one who is sent? Or one who preaches. How will one preach unless he is sent? I'm not talking about the guy that stands behind the pulpit. It's talking about every believer in Jesus Christ. 
You have the job to proclaim the gospel, to preach the gospel. Preaching doesn't mean you have to stand up behind a pulpit or, or stand out on a street corner with a megaphone yelling at people. It just means that wherever you are, you live the gospel in front of people and you tell people who Jesus is, just like Anne in, in the story that I started with. She heeded God's call on her life. She heard him speak to her. And she told Hap about Jesus in her own unique way. God actively offers. God actively calls. But also, verse, uh, the, the verses 4 and 5, the third thing we see is that God actively turns hearts. It says, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That in all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. It says, all came to be baptized. There were lots of people who came to be baptized, but there were all kinds of people who came to John and listened to him preach, and they came to be baptized, both Jew and Gentile alike. Now, at the time, what, what's so uncommon? What, what's the big deal about that? Well, here's the big deal about that. At the time that this was happening, really the only people who were baptized were Gentiles who were converting to Judaism. A good Jew had no need to be baptized. But the text here says that all came to be baptized, to John, both Jew and Gentile alike. All of them came to him. God had, had turned their hearts, and they realized, you know, I've not been living for the Lord. I need to repent and, and turn from my wicked ways, turn from my sins, and I need to show how I've done that. And, and this, doing this, John's baptism, his uh, uh, preaching, paved the way for the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. He was able to tell them, there's one who's coming after me. As they came and they were baptized, says they confessed their sins, were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. That's John's baptism. John's baptism paved the way for the coming Messiah. Today, what we practice is called believer's baptism, which means after a person comes to know Christ as Lord and Savior, after they're saved, Baptism symbolically shows what happens when a person is saved. The person is buried in the likeness of Christ, raised to newness of life, a completely new creature once they come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. That's what baptism shows. And Christ came so that all people would have the opportunity to be saved, both Jew and Gentile alike. Jew, Gentile. White, black, brown, yellow, pink. I have a pink son. Hunter. We, we, we jokingly call his, his nickname is Pinky. So he's so fair-skinned, bless his heart, he can't, even, he can't even go to the beach without a shirt on. He has to wear a shirt. To see. You can't get sunscreen strong enough for him. But Jesus Christ came to, 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 to save all people. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, everyone in the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus Christ, our God, is actively turns people's hearts to him. Our God actively authors, he actively calls, he actively turns hearts. And the fourth thing I want you to see is that our God actively immerses people. Verses 6 through 8 says, Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. Talk about losing some weight. Yeah. Verse 7. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me 
who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. And verse 8, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That word baptize, the Greek word baptizo, literally means to immerse, to plunge under. That's why we, that's why we practice baptism by immersion. And not only is that a picture of what happens to us when we come to Christ, that we are buried, that's why we call it the watery grave, buried in the likeness of Christ, raised in newness of life, it's also a picture of what Jesus Christ does to us when he invades our lives and we get saved. He immerses us in his Holy Spirit. Did you catch that? It says, but he, the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, will baptize you, will immerse you with the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you. At the risk of offending some of my uh, brothers and sisters in other denominations, but I don't want to just be sprinkled with the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm saying? I want to be immersed, consumed by the Holy Spirit. I want God's Holy Spirit upon my life. And when we come to know Christ as Lord and Savior, He takes up residence within us. That means that He fills us. We are immersed in His Holy Spirit. God actively immerses us. Number five, God actively verifies what He has said will come to pass. 9 through 11, it says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and was baptized by John, the, John in the Jordan. John said, he's coming, and I'm going to baptize him. I baptized you with water, but you were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it says that Jesus came, and he was baptized by John, the, John in the Jordan. And immediately, verse 10 says, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John's message was verified in God the Son being baptized that day. John had been preaching, there's one coming, there's one coming, there's one coming. He was the voice crying in the wilderness. He was the the Isaiah, the Elijah that that they, they were looking for. He was the one Preparing the way for Jesus Christ to come. And Jesus Christ came and what God had said would happen, happened. Every promise that God ever makes will come true. That is uh, something we can definitely count on. And here at this time, Jesus Christ came. And initially when he came, when you read it in in, uh, Matthew and Luke's account, John kind of balks at Jesus and no, I... Dude, I don't need to be baptizing you. You need to be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no. For me to be obedient and for my ministry to begin here, I have to be baptized by you. And so he was. And this inaugurated his earthly ministry. And what we have here at the baptism of Jesus Christ is what's called a theophany, all right? It's where we see the complete God present. You have God the Son, Jesus Christ. We have God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. It says that the Holy Spirit descended as a dove, or or like a dove would. And and he rested upon God the Son. And we heard the voice of God the Father speaking, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. God, in his fullness, is present there. As God verifies What Jesus had been, uh, or what John had been preaching about. Whatever God does, as I have read through the scriptures, whenever God's getting ready to do something great, not every time, but many times, he announces it beforehand. He was going to destroy Nineveh. He sent Jonah to tell him, I'm going to destroy Nineveh. You want to be saved? You need to turn from what you're doing. And they did. Jonah didn't like it, but they did. 
and he relinquished his hand. Now later on in history, Nineveh kicked back up again and started sinning against God and doing all kinds of atrocities, and God, sure enough, he just destroyed them. When God... The flood. God told Noah, I'm going to send a flood. You need to build a boat. And Noah preached for over a hundred years. God's going to send a flood. Please, please, repent from what you're doing. Get on the ark. You can be saved. And they said, you're a crazy old man. And only eight were saved. Noah, his wife, and his sons and their wives. But God had announced it beforehand that it was coming. Babylonian uh, captivity. God announced it beforehand that it was coming. Now, God doesn't always announce everything. God has announced already that, hey, Jesus Christ is coming back. I don't know how many of you follow the, uh, the news or um, uh, strange, weird things that happen in the news, but April 23rd, the world's supposed to end again. Look, God has already announced that he's coming back. But he did say this, no man knows the hour, the day, or the hour of when I'm coming. I will come like a thief in the night. So that tells me you better be ready now. God has said it. It's going to happen. And as you look at the seasons in which we are living, I believe it's going to be sometime soon. But I don't know the exact day or the exact hour. I'm certain it's probably not going to be April 23rd, though, because like Brother Bill says, um, uh, sometimes if, if somebody were to get lucky and pick the right day, I think God might change it just to spite them. Anyway. But God is active in that he is the author of our salvation. He calls us to serve. He turns people's hearts uh, to to come to know him. He he immerses us in his Holy Spirit. He, He verifies what he has said that he is going to do. And the sixth thing, the last thing I want you to see in our text is that God actively engages the enemy. Verse 12, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Verse 13, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Now, that's all Mark gives us about the temptation in the wilderness. Matthew and Luke go into greater detail. But that's all that Mark gives us. What we do know about his temptation from reading the, the other accounts is that when Jesus was in there, tempted, uh, Satan tempted him three times. And each time, Jesus' weapon of choice was, who can tell me? The Word of God. That's right. Scripture. Scripture. Uh, Jesus used Scripture to fight uh, the, the enemy. When we engage the enemy... Ephesians chapter 6, Paul writes and he tells us to put on the armor of God. Note, it is not our armor, it is God's armor. Our armor is kind of like a wet paper bag. God's armor can stand the test. It can stand up to engagement with the enemy because it's God's armor. The, the uh, uh, belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the, uh, um, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of of peace, uh, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation, and here it is the sword of the Spirit. The only offensive weapon listed in God's armor is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When we do battle, the only weapon that we need when we engage the enemy is the Word of God. That's why it's important to read God's Word, to study God's Word, to memorize God's Word, to hide it in our hearts so that we might not sin against God. So when we come up to those those times in our lives where we uh, 
face something that God's word will tell us yes or no. How do I proceed from here? God is active in our lives. It's God's word that he uses in our life when we face trials and temptations and difficulties of all time, all kinds. There are some here, I'm sure, that, man, life is going great for you. Uh, you, you know truly that you are doing better than you deserve, and life is grand. I rejoice with you. I praise God for you. There are others here that you are, quite frankly, just beat up. The world has just crushed you. I want you to know God is not sitting idly by saying, good luck to you. God is active. He is working for you. When you get to that place in your life where you don't know how to pray, God's praying for you. Did you know that? Romans tells us that the Holy Spirit, when we don't know how to pray or even what to pray, that the Holy Spirit is praying for us with utterances and groanings that we don't even understand. He is praying for us. He's active. He's not just sitting idly by. He's not a passive God. And He cares about you. And He is working out a plan for you. If you will only place your faith and trust in Him. Realize that he is your strength. He is your strong tower, as I prayed a while ago. Run into him. Rest beneath the shelter of his wings. When we cannot do what needed to be done, God actively sent his son, Jesus Christ, to do for us what we could not do. One, pay the price for our sin. Two, set us free from the bonds of that sin. To be resurrected so that we might have eternal life. So that we might have, as Jesus told them in John 10:10, 10, 10, that He has come that we might have life and have it to its fullest. Does that mean that nothing's ever going to go wrong in our lives? No, it does not. But it means that we can face the difficulties in life with the assurance that God is there. He loves us. He cares for us. He is working for our good. Romans 8.28 tells us that God works all things to the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. We learn today that believers in Jesus Christ have a calling on their life. Love God. Love Him. Call upon Him. Depend upon Him. He is your salvation. Let's pray.